Hello, uh, welcome to uh, the July 2020 webinar. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Kramer. I am the Calibration Program Manager at Perry Johnson Laboratory Accreditation. And uh, we will be presenting today on ISO 17025, 2017. We want to take a look at the requirements in Section 63, which is the facilities and environmental conditions be it in your fixed facility at customer site or perhaps even a mobile facility. And we're going to also look at section 6.4, which is the section on equipment. So as always, uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, uh, go directly to the PJLA website, uh, go to the link for recorded webinars. Um, also, the individual slides are also presented, or excuse me, also available. Um, feel free to get them from our website, uh, use them internally, how you um, feel they could be beneficial to you. Um, on your screen, as always, there should be a block for, for questions. So if anything comes up uh, during uh, the course of today's presentation, uh, feel free to type that in. Please keep uh, questions related to, to today's topics, section 6.3 and section 6.4. And at the conclusion of the webinar, um, I will uh, have a look uh, and try to answer as many as I can. Um, the duration of this webinar is set for no longer than one hour. So we're going to jump into uh, section 6.3, facilities and environmental conditions. So um, uh, right now um, we're still going through the, a transition between the 2005-2017 standard. So uh, those of you that are already transitioned to 2017, you should be up to speed and versed on the uh, the differences, which uh, there there are no significant changes in this section. Uh, primarily, the biggest difference is um when calibrations or testing or sampling are performed outside the uh your fixed facility outside of your permanent control the standard requires that the uh, environmental and facilities related to the requirements be met um if not this would be considered a deviation so we'll take a look at that that requirement and um go through that section Okay, so getting into the uh, the standard, uh, section 6.3, first clause, 6.3.1. Nothing new there. The facilities and environmental conditions shall be suitable for the laboratory activities and shall not vers adversely affect the validity of your results. Of course, uh, you know, with or without the 2017 standard requirement there, that is something I'm sure that everybody would be adhering to. Um, there's a note note within the standard here. So a note, uh, FYI, for those of you that um, are not familiar with with what they are, they're not requirements. They're just additional information. I call them FYI that goes along with the standard. So um, uh, some things that could perhaps affect the validity of results can be uh, things such as microbiological contamination, dust, electric magnetic disturbances, radiation. Humidity, electrical supply, temperature, sound, and vibration um, can all adversely, uh, perhaps adversely affect the testing, calibration, or sampling that you're doing. Okay, 632, the requirements for facilities and environmental conditions necessary for the performance of the laboratory activities shall be documented. So we have a shall there, which is a requirement. So, um, in other words, if you're doing a test or calibration, and for example, uh, what I have depicted here, if the, within that test or calibration, the temperature is to be within 68 plus or minus 2 degrees F, relative humidity to be greater than 50%, instructions regarding uh, uh, the unit under test as far as any stabilization period and when or when not to proceed with calibration due to uh, predefined limit set for any uh, environmental criteria. It's fine that they're in place. Uh, assessor uh, may very well ask you, but they need to be documented. Uh, um, let's just see, shall be 
documented. So usually that could be within the internal procedure, typically is a good place uh, for those uh, parameters to be documented. 643, the laboratory shall monitor, control, and record environmental conditions in accordance with relevant specifications, methods, or procedures, or where they influence the validity of results. So we have monitoring there. So perhaps uh, your environment needs to be stable over a period, period of time. Uh, you can see any fluctuation uh, within a, a set period. Uh, sort of got depicted on the screen there as a, typically a data logger is something where you can go back uh, perhaps uh, um, starting your day's activities, just to assure that the uh, environmental parameters have been stable before um, proceeding. Control. So if if your uh, procedure protocol is specifying oh environmental controls such as temperature, uh, perhaps humidity um, uh, type controls, um, your your facility should be able to meet those criteria and control it and perhaps set those set points and record. So typically uh, that's captured at the time of test or calibration, um, the um, significant environmental conditions that can affect the re re results are typically recorded and captured at that, uh, at, that, uh, at that moment when the testing or calibration is being um, performed. All right, uh, 643. Uh, one slight difference here. This is a uh, left over, this is uh, carried over from the 2005 standard. Measures to control facilities shall be implemented, monitored, and what's changed is this uh, periodically reviewed and shall include, but not limited to, things like access to and, uh, to and use of areas affecting laboratory activities. Of course, you only want the laboratory personnel um, to have access to those uh, areas, uh, not uh, folks from outside testing calibration. Perhaps the UPS man should not be able to uh, go into these areas. And uh, sort of depicting here access, uh, it's up to um, the individual organization to, the, to uh, set the uh, um, parameters for access, perhaps a, a sign, a locked door, or uh, for more critical type testing calibrations, perhaps uh, some sort of scanning device may be needed. Um, shall include, but not limited to, prevention of contamination, interference, or adversely adverse influences on laboratory activities. Hence, it should have no cross contamination or perhaps a electromagnetic type frequency that could perhaps affect equipment. And of course, effective separation between areas within kept incompatible laboratory activities. So if you have a, 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 a sensitive area where vibration is uh, very uh, um, susceptible to be picking up, be picked up, you don't want any sort of uh, activity that may incorporate that uh, um, within that specific area of testing or calibration. Okay, so here, uh, what we were talking about, the, the key difference between the two, two standards, 2005-2017. Uh, when the laboratory performed laboratory activities at sites or facilities outside its permanent control, it shall ensure that the requirements related to facilities and environmental conditions of this document are met. So uh, this would uh, be, for instance, uh, on-site calibrations. A lot of folks have uh, laboratories, excuse me, calibration facilities come on their lab um, into their uh, facilities and, and do the calibrations right there on site. Um, organizations are accredited to do that, a PJLA on our scopes of accreditation. And I am the calibration program manager um, at Perry Johnson. Uh, when our assessors go, does an assessment, you can be accredited to do it at the fixed facility. You can be accredited to do it at the customer site, or you can be accredited to do it do it at uh, both at a, at your fixed lab facility and also at the uh, customer site. So, for example, um, in that previous example that we gave, where uh, 
the, the, the testing or calibration protocol was setting parameters for temperature at 68 degrees Fahrenheit plus or minus two. So this would be if you go on site and you're at the customer's facility, of course, you're not controlling that. And perhaps it was 73, 74 degrees. So according to what uh, 635, you have to assure those uh, environmental criteria are met. But I'm uh, um, jump ahead in the standard and actually um, 7.4.3 in handling the testing calibrations uh, items. So if that was the case, if you went, um, if you were at a uh, customer's location doing testing and ca or, or calibration and they were outside your protocol um, and as stated here from 743, when the customer requires the item to be tested or calibrated, acknowledging a deviation from specified conditions, the laboratory shall include a disclaimer in the report indicating which results may be affected by the deviation. So in other words, um, uh, in that, in those particular instances, the uh, organization is obliged to uh, bring the um, bring this deviation, be it uh, uh, out of uh, temperature predefined limits, to the customer's uh, attention and gain their approval before proceeding with the calibration or test. And uh, also, it needs to be documented on the report. Uh, um, as far as which results may have been affected by the deviation. Okay, I uh, believe that's the end of section 6.3. Not a whole lot of changes in, in there, except the, that last one uh, that we just went over. So we're going to switch gears here. We're going to look at section 6.4, which is the section on equipment. Again, uh, not a whole lot of... Uh, change here between 2005-2017. Uh, one thing, it's more specific now as far as when equipment needs to be calibrated as opposed to be uh, just being verified. And we'll get to that clause where um, what would uh, determine that would be things such as uncertainty or, of course, if the measurements need to be traceable, the calibrations associated with the uh, uh, Equipment that uh, would also need to be traceable, which would include also a measurement uncertainty. And there's uh, expanded uh, references to reference materials, which is a, a standard that the PJLA will actually uh, have that we acc accredit uh, reference material producers to, which is 17034. And it has been included to emphasize the competence of reference material producers. So in other words, like 17025 is, could be criteria for testing and calibration uh, facilities, 17034 um, could be used as a um, qualifier for competence of reference material producers. So you have uh, nothing new here. You have to have the, uh, the tools to do the job, basically. 641, the laboratory shall have access to equipment, including but not limited to measuring equipment, software, measurement standards, reference materials, reference data, reagents, consumables, or auxiliary apparatus that is required for the correct performance of laboratory activities and that can influence the results. So uh, like I said, you have to have the tools to do the job. Uh, you have to have equipment that are capable of meeting um, your uh, your accuracy requirements, and uh, not just hard type equipment that we have have on uh, depicted here, such as a temperature bath there. Um, also things such as software um, and other things that are referenced here. So here's the, uh, uh, and these are notes. Uh, we mentioned uh, 17034. I'm not gonna read all this, but uh, basically this just brings out the attention to 17034 and how that relates to reference materials and uh, competencies of reference material producers, um, which is, like I said, it's a 17025 standard that the PJLA will, uh, we actually have some facilities we actually accredit to this standard. It's also reference here to uh, ISO guide 33, which is uh, provides guidance on selection and use of materials. 
Um, and ISO Guide 80 provide guidance to produce in-house quality control materials. Okay, uh, when the <clears throat> excuse me, when the laboratory uses equipment outside its permanent control, it shall ensure that the requirements for equipment of this document are met. So one thing that comes to mind, if for whatever reason uh, you had to perhaps uh, use equipment that's not yours, perhaps yours yours is down, um, and you uh, perhaps to uh, uh, something you could perhaps rent, for example, or acquire or use that uh, perhaps a uh, uh, somebody else within the industry may uh, allow you to use. Uh, one thing that comes to mind, first of all, is traceability. So uh, if you're using equipment outside your permanent control, you have to assure, for example, that it's providing the traceability. Um, I did do a, an assessment some time ago where the facility was going to be utilizing this on a uh, full-time basis for, oh, not just periodically utilize someone else's equipment to expand a range. Technically, they could do that. However, they also had to assure the, the traceability. And another thing that came to mind is the uh, intermediate checks of that equipment. So just because the equipment was, say, Calibrate it. You might have a report. Uh, if it's going to be something that's going to be done on an on ongoing basis, you want to have some sort of control to ensure that the integrity of that calibration is still intact. Okay, uh, 643. Uh, there is a, uh, nothing new here. The laboratory shall have a procedure for the handling, transport, storage, use, and plan maintenance of equipment in order to ensure proper functioning and to prevent contamination or deterioration. So uh, whenever you see shall have a procedure, a procedure is something in place that tells you how something is done. When I look at this requirement, particularly those folks that are doing uh, on-site type calibration, I like to see a good procedure where somebody could read, understand when you're taking that equipment, you're actually moving it, taking it off site, uh, setting it up somewhere else. Um, so again, uh, should be packed, secured, sort of like in a Pelican case that's uh, depicted uh, over there to the left. And uh, um, the whole process of packing, transporting, and perhaps setting up at the customer's site. Uh, uh, have to have a procedure or something that tells you how this is done. That's per 643. Okay, so here we, we look at the uh, some of the key differences here between 2005, 2017. So 644 states the laboratory shall verify that equipment conforms to specific requirements before being placed or returned in the service. So of course, you know, you want to make sure before you, uh, um, you have new equipment or perhaps it was uh, uh, in need of repair, fix, and you're placing it back into service if there are any specific requirements that needed to be met that the equipment can meet it. Um, you can see the key differences there. Uh, 2017 was specific. Um, it states, uh, before being placed in the service, equipment, including that used for sampling, shall be calibrated or checked to establish that it meets, uh, meets uh, laboratory specifications. So what's uh, difference here between 2005-2017, uh, which we'll get to here in a little bit, um, is when we look at the calibration. This uh, gives us a little bit uh, of guidance as to when equipment has to be calibrated. Uh, however, before we get to that, uh, 645, the equipment used for measurement shall be capable of achieving the measurement accuracy and or measurement uncertainty required to provide a valid results. So uh, what I have listed here is, for example, if, if in your testing protocol you needed a te testing device to capture temperature and it needed to be um, accurate within, say, half a degree Celsius. Um, of course, uh, the piece of equipment I'm depicting over there on the left, uh, um, you can just look at the resolution of something like that. That's not going to um, 
be uh, acceptable in order to meet that criteria. So if you asked, had equipment that, uh, let's say, was graduated in 10th of a degree, well, that's great. Uh, you want to have it uh, calibrated and tested. You want to make sure that the organization can also meet your accuracy requirements. So what I have depicted uh, on the right there is if you had that requirement, uh, 0.5 degrees C, you want to assure that the calibration facility can meet those requirements. Uh, so uh, the section on uh, calibration scopes of accreditation, calibration and measurement uh, capabilities, that is basically the best that the lab uh, is accredited to perform. That's a, a, another name for the best uncertainty that the calibration lab can produce. So in other words, if you had that accuracy requirement and you're sending it to a, a facility that had that on their scope of accreditation, um, that's the best they're going to be able to produce for you under their scope of accreditation. So they're not going to give you an uncertainty less than 0.66. So if you needed to, your your uh, device to be within 0.5, uh, this particular uh, example of this organization would not be able to meet those requirements. Okay, so uh, we, we specified equipment needed to be verified. However, uh, measuring equipment shall be calibrated when, and we mentioned uncertainty, the measurement accuracy and measurement uncertainty affects the validity of the reported, of the reported result and or calibration of the equipment is required to establish metrological traceability on the reported results. So in other words, perhaps that equipment, the uncertainty is a component of your uncertainty. So you need to have that. And if you're stating your measurements are traceable, then of course the equipment associated with that. And traceability is sometimes a term that gets uh, tossed around loosely. Um, PL2 is our, our, our document at uh, Perry Johnson for our policy regarding traceability. Um, and of course, if, it, if you're providing traceable measurements, you want to make sure that your uh, equipment will be calibrated uh, supporting your, your traceability. So what type of equipment that we're talking about? Um, uh, could be equipment directly related to your measurements, such as a lab balance, perhaps. Um, could be auxiliary equipment. Uh, if you are monitoring temperature, that uh, um, say that temperature device is not really directly related to the testing. Um, that uh, can, that uh, however, can uh, um, affect the validity and the temperature is being monitored, so those types of auxiliary equipment. And those used to obtain measurements calculated from multiple quantities. One thing that comes to mind here is air buoyancy, uh, temperature, barometric, uh, pressure, and humidity um, all captured and calculates uh, an air buoyancy type of correction there. Okay, calibration programs. So uh, you have equipment, of course you have to have it calibrated. Uh, you need uh, calibration should not just be a one-time thing. Have to uh, as stated here that you, the laboratory shall establish a calibration program, uh, which shall be reviewed and adjusted as necessary in order to maintain confidence in the status of calibration. That's always a question that comes up quite often. How often do we have to have our equipment calibrated. Um, and as you see here, of course, a, a program needs to be, be established. Um, so uh, let's say you originally start one year. So one thing that always needs to be considered when you uh, establish a calibration program is the risk. So if you have a new device, is it uh, going to be stable? Um, and is it going to drift at all and perhaps drift out of tolerance in a, a year's time. Um, if it is, then uh, uh, perhaps you said a year, it comes out and it was out of tolerance, then you might have a whole year of non-conforming work that needs to be investigated. Um, so uh, calibration programs, they, they do initially need to be set and they should be reviewed and adjusted. So that uh, um, adjustment's a little bit easier after you have a little bit of history behind your artifacts. If you send them out every year and you're looking at them and you're seeing some drift on it, it's getting closer and closer to drifting out of tolerance, then you may, may want to shorten that uh, calibration interval. If you're uh, 
spending a lot of money having it calibrated to say every six months every year and you have some history behind the item uh and you're seeing this pretty rock solid it hasn't drifted or 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 have any noticeable changes uh within uh within calibrations then it might be criteria to um increasing the uh, calibration interval and then also other things that can be considered is if you have a good system of intermediate checks on your equipment whereas uh for example you can have control charts or checks against reference standards or reference material where if uh, equipment was to drift out of uh, specifications you would pick that up uh, um, that could be used if you have a good system of intermediate checks as a criteria for adjusting the calibration interval okay uh 648 all equipment requiring calibration or which has a defined period of validity shall be labeled coded or otherwise identifiable to allow the user of the equipment to and i highlight it readily identify the status of calibration or a period of validity. So 2005, it was specific, they had to be labeled or coded. So typically you would see a, uh, as far as meeting those requirements, you're looking at some sort of perhaps calibration label or sticker on the device. Somebody should be able to pick up the instrument, look at it, see when it was uh, calibrated and perhaps when the next calibration is due. Uh, that's no longer required. However, you know, if you are, of course, labeling your equipment, you're still going to meet the requirements right there because it's still going to be readily available. Um, however, it's not a uh, instant nonconformance if uh, it's not labeled. As an assessor or an internal auditor, if it's not obvious looking at the equipment, uh, as long as it's readily available. So perhaps a technician has all that device right there um, on their uh, laptop or computer. They can go and they can look at the equipment list, see uh, where everything was calibrated, when it's due. Perhaps it's color coded. Uh, used to work for an organization, had a lot of equipment. It would turn yellow uh, when it was so close to being uh, past due for calibration. Uh, perhaps turn a, a an orange when it was very close to being out, and then a bright red when it was actually out of calibration. That's uh, didn't really need to have the uh, have it labeled there. Could pull it up and and easily see it right there at your fingertips. Okay, nothing new here. Uh, Six four nine equipment that has been subject to overloading or mishandling give questionable results or has been shown to be defective or outside specified requirements shall be taken out of service. It shall be isolated to prevent its use or clearly labeled or marked as being out of service until it has been verified to perform correctly. The laboratory shall examine the, examine the effect of defect or deviation from specified requirements and shall initiate the management of non-conforming work procedures specified in 710. So in other words, if your equipment is malfunctioning, it's given suspicious results, uh, sort of uh, is uh, specified here, should be labeled ideally isolated so uh, it's not used. Um, um uh, also if uh, for whatever reason if it was discovered after the fact that the equipment was given sus um susceptible type results uh then uh in that case and perhaps testing or calibration results have gone to the customer um the uh, protocol established for non-conforming work would have to be followed 710. So in other words, an impact analysis to determine whether or not it actually affected work that went out the door. Okay, 6410, when intermediate checks are necessary to maintain confidence in the performance of the equipment, these checks shall be carried out in accordance to a procedure. So you folks that are uh, uh, testing testing laboratories, when you have controlled, say, spikes or blanks, that's incorporated in the in your procedure. Um, that uh, falls in line with what we have required here in 6410. If you're an organization, perhaps you have balance checks that's incorporated in the procedure. Have your balance calibrated. If the intermediate checks uh, um, here is uh, what's being performed on the right 
just uh, checking the balance prior to the day's activity, assuring that it's within predefined limits of acceptance before proceeding with the day's activities. Okay, uh, 6411, talk about correction factors here. When calibration or reference material data include reference values or correction factors, the laboratory shall ensure the reference values or correction factors are updated and implemented as appropriate to meet specific specified requirements. So uh, what we're talking about here um, is when you send in your equipment in, say, to be calibrated, uh, you typically get the data. And uh, you you know uh, if you ought to know if, whether or not you need to utilize the uh, correction factor. So for other, in other words, let's say you have test ways as long as they meet ASTM, say, class one tolerances, then you can use it as nominal. For example, so at uh, 100 degrees, the correction factor is minus 0.2, 110 is point, minus 0.3, 120 is minus 0.3. So if this piece of equipment, perhaps when it says update, uh, um, update and implement it as appropriate to meet specifications, perhaps these correction factors are actually utilized in um, spreadsheets. So when you have when you uh, take an instrument reading, it will automatically add or subtract your correction factor. Um, so that's that's what we're talking about there. When you have your instruments calibrated and you're using correction, if you're using correction factor, you want to make sure they're updated. So they're there to be reviewed. So uh, for for example, what I have depicted at the bottom there at 110, um, let's say it was degrees degrees. F, for example, 100 degrees of Fahrenheit, we have a correction factor of minus 0.3. So in other words, when it act, when that instrument was stating 110 degrees Fahrenheit, the actual true temperature that's, that it, uh, is being um, presented is 109.7. So it's not exactly reading 110 when it's 110. It's reading 109.7. So it may be important for you to utilize correction factors. It may not be, depending, um, you know, if it's the tolerance, if, as long as it's within the specified tolerance um, and uh, correction factors uh, may or may not be needed. Uh, nothing new here. The laboratory shall take practical measures to prevent unintended adjustments of equipment from invalidating the results. So uh, equipment can be adjusted. So of course you don't want that to, to happen uh, during, during use. You don't want to have someone um, uh, get into the adjusting a cavity, a cavity and uh, make an adjustment. Uh, the integrity of the traceable calibrations would go right out the window. So uh, what I have to pick to here at the top, uh, Oh, hard lead wire seal. My day, my days as a state waste and measures inspector used to use those on gas pumps a lot. Uh, we would check a gas pump and uh, we would seal it. So if we came back a year later and that seal was broken, that would mean somebody went in there and perhaps tampered with the uh, adjustment of, say, that gasoline pump. Uh, right there, uh, that's uh, supposed to be a pipette. A lot of times uh, it's a simple screw, some sort of set screw that's behind there where you would physically take a device and move that uh, screw to uh, to make the adjustments. Ideally, that needs to be sealed, some sort of sticker or something over top of that adjusting cavity where if that's broken and it's looked at, the integrity of the, uh, like I said, the integrity of the calibration uh, could be in the question. To pick that there uh, at the bottom there, a lot of times, you know, electronics, we're seeing this done uh, like, uh, uh, via uh, a calibration mode. You have to go into the uh, uh, electronics and you have to have specific codes in order to go in and make an adjustment. So uh, nothing nothing new there, just uh, trying to depict the, uh, you know, ways that, uh, to prevent, uh, of course, you as a user, you want to make sure that uh, your equipment, uh, nothing's being done to break it. That's why uh, you should have these, uh, um, uh, something like some sort of a, a seal or something, which uh, if it's broken, 
you could go in and perhaps uh, question the integrity of the calibration. All right. Uh, Coming down the home stretch here for records. Uh, so you have to have equipment. We need to have records for our equipment. 6413, records shall be retained for equipment, which can infl influence laboratory activities. These records shall include the following, and I highlight it where applicable. So uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind is location. If you're one lab, small lab, uh, one uh, technician, you know, the location's you know, fairly obvious. If you have multiple technicians, perhaps they have vans or assigned equipment, then it may be applicable. So, of course, uh, these are the records. A, the uh, most of, I believe everything here is crosswalked from the 2005 over to 2017. The identity of the equipment, including software and firmware version. The manufacturer's name, type identification, and serial number, unique identification. Evidence of verification that equipment conforms with specified requirements. Could be your intermediate checks, and uh, could also just be the calibration, which is uh, um, specified there under E. Let's say the current location. So maybe you have a different equipment that's assigned to different departments or perhaps different technicians, or perhaps you have multiple sites. E, calibration dates. You want, to, of course, your uh, Basically, all these would be on your actual calibration reports. Calibration to result dates, results of calibration, any adjustments, the acceptance criteria, and the due date of the next calibration or the calibration interval. Uh, reference material, F, documentation of reference material, results, acceptance criteria, relevant dates, and the period of validity. And maintenance plan. The maintenance plan and maintenance carried out to date where relevant to the performance of the equipment. So if you had a, a piece of equipment was a malfunction, you want to uh, keep that record, uh, what was done to it, uh, um, what was replaced in it. It could be maintenance, plan maintenance, uh, germinators, one thing that came to mind in one of my past uh, experiences, we had those set, they had to be cleaned and uh, um, and, and serviced uh, periodically. H, details of any damage, malfunctions, modifications, or repairs of the equipment. Okay, that brings us to the end of uh, um, 7 8. Excuse me, that's a typo there. I need to change that. That's section 6 4. Uh, Please disregard that at the top here. I'll change that and send it to PJLA for the webinar slide. So uh, thank you for your attention. So um, what we're going to do now, and like I tell you, this is, uh, this is real live. So I'm actually going to just now see what the questions uh, we have typed in here. Okay, I'm reading these just as their type on. Let me get my copy of the standard here. So we're on the same page here. Um, on uh, clause 632, and 632 is the clause where um, the requirements for facilities, environmental conditions uh, necessary for the performance of laboratory activities shall be documented. Uh, we have test requirements, for example, in range of 30, excuse me, 20 to 30. Would it be sufficient by laboratory to document it by their own without third party, like Ministry of Labor, et cetera? Um, means isn't ISO 1705 about measurement quality? But well, we don't want to make up any requirements here. So just look at the requirements as, uh, as stated. So as far as 17025 requirements are, it says they need to be documented, whether the laboratory documents them themselves or you utilize an outside source. Now, with that being said, also, you know, quality is important. The one thing that sets 17025 apart is, <clears throat> is uh, technical competencies. So if you're an accredited organization, 
um, ideally, you're going to document um, your uh, accuracy requirements where it's not going to have any impact on your test or calibration and should be able to back that up. The assessor, our assessors that go out, they should be technically competent in uh, the field that they're assessing. So uh, that would be something that, that would be assessed. If you have something unreasonable there and the assessor felt that could adversely impact and you don't have, uh, um, can't really back that up, it's just perhaps came out of thin air, then um, that would be an issue. All right, for 642, then we're getting into facilities here. When the laboratory uses, uses equipment outside its permanent control, we shall ensure that the requirement for this equipment are documented. 642, um, what, what if, and I'm reading it as it's typed, what if what you are using calibrated measuring equipment for the data trending with a piece of equipment that does not have a calibration? You can look at that many many ways. Uh, you, if you, if it needs to be traceable, it needs to be calibrated. If it's directly related, if you're using something <clears throat> like a check standard, where we mentioned you have something calibrated or something that's out of your control, um, and you have it back, and you have a a something that you can compare it with, and um, you, uh, and I'm assuming that because of the clause you, you have referenced there, it's not out. Of, it's it's out of your control. Um, as long as that initial traceability is intact, you have a traceable calibration, <clears throat> you had it checked, and then uh, it's out of your control, and then you use it again. If you're able to utilize that same, and I call them check standard, working standard, um, uh, you need to uh, um, hopefully have a predefined limits of acceptance. The, the check standard or working standard should be a stable type of artifact. If you're able to check it again, and and I'm assuming that's what you're referring to here, uh, see if there was any drift, then I would say you're, you, that would be an acceptable type of control and assuring, in this case, a traceability. I'm not sure what this question is referred, referring to. I'm missing something here. Retain for how long? Even though more, I'm not real sure uh, what you're referring to there. Uh. <clears throat> if we have a barometer that we get calibrated every two years, do we need to verify in-house between calibration? If so, how do we do that? Is an internal reference barometer needed? If so, do we calibrate the internal reference barometer? You get into the specific example and, and uh, <clears throat> perhaps related to a specific test. <clears throat> if your, <clears throat> excuse me, if your barometer uh, needs to be traceable, if it's say it's a contributor to the uncertainty, then of course it needs to be calibrated. Um, if it uh, if it drifts and it goes out of those tolerances, um, and that would um, adversely impact your testing or calibration results, then it may be a good idea to have intermediate checks. So uh, just bear in mind when if you're waiting two years and you have nothing in place over the two year period, there's a section on risk here. <laughs> so you may have to look at a section A5 and perhaps do a risk analysis. Um, if that drift out, uh, you know, how, how far would it need to drift before it would actually impact any sort of results? Um, that's a determination that you have to make if it's critical. Um, I would say, uh, and you're going two years without uh, having it calibrated, uh, a good check standard or reference, uh, reference standard, excuse me, a good check standard or working standard may be a good idea as an intermediate check. Or perhaps you could have two of them and intercompare the two. Just depends on how critical that is to your uh, testing results. Uh, 
do you do you calibrate the internal reference barometer that's that's not really needed unless you feel it's drifting so if you're comparing a standard to a to an unknown um and you're just looking at the differences there <clears throat> and looking for drift then uh no for the uh check standard uh you don't uh, i would say necessarily have to have that uh, calibrated Can you go over again uh, in situations that calibration factors are not <clears throat> necessary? <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about, uh, excuse me, um, grab a drink here, talking about the correction factors there. So one thing you need to uh, look at here is when you send equipment to, be, to send in for calibration, um, you should be specifying to the lab, uh, and we're talking about the statements of conformance. Um, what type of uh, if you if you require a statement of conformance? So, in other words, if you're saying something passes, fails, intolerances, or out of tolerances, and you made a determination, and I think I gave the example of an ASTM E617 Class One, which is an analytical type test weight. Let's say five grams. So if, if you made a determination that if your device is within that tolerance, as long as you're a shortest within that tolerance, you can just use it as nominal, say five grams dead on. Um, if uh, you wanted, if you needed to use a correction factor um, and uh, you look on the calibration report and perhaps you're, you're not getting a statement of compliance, you're just going to use the actual value and utilize the uncertainty as a component of your uncertainty. So that would be a case where perhaps you look on the report and at the five gram weight, you look at the, uh, the apparent mass value that the calibration lab assigned it. It might be 0.5, excuse me, 5.000032 uh, grams, excuse me, yeah, <laughs> grams. So if that's critical, if you needed to carry, you know, that fraction of a milligram correction to your application, then of course you would be carrying the correction factor. If if it's just within a specific tolerance, and it's lo if, as long as it's within that tolerance, um, it's going to meet your intended use. Then you would not need to carry a correction factor. Can internal calibration on balances be used for daily verification? <clears throat> you're, you're talking about calibration or verification. Um, <clears throat> I'm assuming if you're just uh, putting the, uh, you have the uh, balances calibrated, you're checking them with traceable test weights, um, then that would be considered an intermediate check. Um, if you're actually doing a calibration, uh, and it needs to be a traceable calibration, then it needs to have an appropriate procedure. Um, it needs to have traceable standards. Personnel is going to have to be trained and competent to do that. The best thing I can uh, refer you to in this case is we addressed this uh, directly in uh, our PJLA's policy on measurement traceability. PL2, we talk about in house calibrations. So, um, if you have, if you um, going to perform them internally, as far as your accrediting body, we assess them just like an accredited type calibration. So you have to have proper procedure. You have to have the tools to do the job. Your personnel has to be trained and competent, and the environmental criteria needs to be be met. Um, if you have a good system of intermediate checks, if you have the, your balances calibrated every year, and you're able to if you have a good system of intermediate checks, you can detect any sort of drift. Um, then if for whatever reason, if the balances did drift out of calibration, um, you should be able to pick those up with the intermediate check. So basically that's what the daily verification is. It's an intermediate check. Uh, and then again, you have to look at risk. So if you're doing your daily verification, of course, with any sort of quality check, you wanna have predefined limits of acceptance. So um, if you de determine, say, on a balance, um, a milligram was acceptable for the balance to be 
be off and you verify that with the weights and uh, you do it every day, worst case scenario, if it drifted, you'll have uh, one day of uh, non-conforming work that needs to be looked at. Um, if you go a, a week, say that's doing it, it was okay week one, you go seven days, you check it again, and it's out of those predefined limits, then you have to uh, go back a week. So again, refer to uh, PL2 for internal calibration. If that, I'm not sure if you're just talking about the verification. Yes, you can use a, a daily verification of your balances as a good system of intermediate checks. Uh, okay, this is your assess assessment body. I can't give you any uh, recommendation for thermometer calibration. What you could do is uh, go on our, our uh, site, uh, and all accrediting bodies are required to list their accredited labs. So if you wanted to, of course, look for a good 17025 provider and you have tight accuracy requirements like we specified. Uh, we have uh, um, talked about what a CMC and that's the best that the laboratory can, can produce. Uh, you can go into, and I'm speaking on behalf of PJLA, you can go on our website and all, like I said, all accrediting bodies are required by ILAC to list the, uh, um, uh, the scopes of accreditation. But I know for ours, I can go into ours. If I want it thermodynamic, for example, I want to list all the labs that are accredited to do thermodynamic. I can weed that out. Um, and it will pull up all the labs that are 17025 uh, accredited, or you can just put temperature or if it's a thermal couple or, or whatever, you could look for those keywords. And then you could go and you could look at the various scopes of accreditation. Um, all those labs have been assessed by us uh, on our website and have been de determined to be uh, competent and capable of performing those ranges and those uh, specific uh, CMCs that you have see depicted there. What criteria would you compare against to determine whether a calibration factor is too large? Uh, not really sure what you, if you're uh, basically, if you're looking at the, you know, the correction factor off a calibration report and uh, you're not, uh, uh, um, uh, having a, uh, uh, statement of compliance say it's within so many you know plus or minus so many if you don't have that pass uh pass fail criteria with any any of these if it's too large uh the, the end thing you want to determine is the end result so um if if that correction factor is too loud and it adversely impacts your testing or calibration uh results then then of course the uh calibration factor would be too large if you're actually using the calibration factor and that's too large and that's what what's being assigned to it by the calibration uh facility then then you probably need to have a a different artifact or standard that's uh perhaps <laughs> doesn't have such a such a large um correction factor When I was on on uh, the calibration side, I when I would uh, one thing I would always look at, and of course uncertainty, I would always look at the extreme case. So uh, we had software um, that did calculations, and I would look at the extreme case uh, on my uh, thermometer calibrations. Uh, uncertainty if it was off by the uh, extreme amount that was specified one, a, one way as opposed to the other way and see what difference it made. And that was uh, um, reflected in my uncertainty. So I had a big uncertainty. Uh, my own uh, uncertainty would of course be large.
Basically, how do you choose plus or minus two degrees? Why not three room temperature? Again, this totally depends on the test or calibration that's being done. If you're following a national protocol, just as an ISO standard, ASTM standard, and it specifies those environmental criteria, and you're doing your test or calibration to them, then, uh, then um, you need to be following what's in those protocol. Um, if you're uh, pulling your own, and what I put there was just a hypothetical situation. Um, three may be, may be fine, um, depending on what test or calibration and what uh, impact the, uh, the um, temperature has, uh, has in play. Uh, we talk about, uh, I do a lot of folks do two balances and scales, anything from an analytical balance to a truck scale. You know, if we're here outside doing a truck scale, of course, the temperature range is not even a factor in those, as opposed to doing uh, something inside an analytical type balance, um, something less industrial use. So it just, just totally depends on what's being tested, what's being calibrated, and what's been determined as far as an acceptable temperature range before uh, it could possibly um, impact the, the testing or calibration results. About the correction factor, can we calculate it? Um, if it's changing, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, you probably could. Uh, perhaps you have a good standard, uh, an artifact that uh, you have confidence in, that uh, um, you can compare it to and, and perhaps come up with your own correction factor. <clears throat> if it needs to be traceable, um, you know, that, that can open up another ball of wax. So it just depends on how it's being done and if its traceability is being, being maintained. Can we get the presentation? Yes, the slides will be uh, um, on the website and also this recording will be on the website. Go to pjla.com um, and uh, you can pull up uh, uh, this recorded version and uh, as well, you can also just uh, get the individual slides. I'm not, I don't think this really pertains. Uh, oh, it's with records. Um, um, is this sufficient to scan an original calibration certificate for your record or do you have to keep the original? With today's uh, um, electronic age, I would say that um, uh, if you if you have a scanning copy of the original, that should be just fine. I'm not sure what the question is here. If you are using calibrated equipment to measure and control test specifications for a piece of, piece of equipment is not calibrated. Not sure, I'm apologize there, Joe. I'm, I'm, I'm not understanding the question there. If you are using calibrated equipment. I'm reading it again. To measure and control test I appreciate the, the kind words, uh, Joseph. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Is there a requirement that the uh, calibration logs for recorded on paper form rather than on an electronic file, Excel sheets, or the log that can be countersigned by a proper authority in the laboratory? I'm assuming you're referring to the uh, um, calibration status of equipment where I stated it uh, doesn't have to be labeled, it has to be readily available. So whether that's uh, on a calibration log or even a, a, a paper log somewhere, um, it uh, as long as it's readily available, so if it's not uh, on the certificate, uh, excuse me, on the certificate, on the equipment, and as an assessor or you as an internal auditor um, should be able to ask the technician what, what is the calibration status 
readily available. You know, I would say that's within a, a minute or two at the most, uh, not uh, not the next morning. Um, as far as paper, you know, we have. Uh, um, I think I'm understanding here. Yeah, it, it's fine if you're making a record still in paper paper form. If a record needs to be altered, then um, you go back to the section on uh, tech. That would be considered a technical record. So for whatever reason, if anything is crossed out, if it's not electronic, the old adage, you should still be able to see what's behind it and uh, who, date, who did it and also date the change. That would need to be uh, followed through. Are fume hoods something that would be under facilities and equipment? I would say so, um, that uh, fume hoods, uh, uh, particularly uh, um, in your, your testing organization, uh, that is something that should be uh, um, considered equipment. And I know they are something that are subjected to tests. So you have uh, air velocity, um, you may have HEFA filters within in the, uh, the, the um, the hoods and depending on what's being tested on there, something that I, I think the, uh, most you most uh, would want it to be be tested and assured that it's uh, operating correctable correctly. You have a this traceable reference thermometer. How often should we send it out to a calibration company? Um, you have to set a calibration program. So we sort of went over that uh, originally, um, and it just depends, I would say, how critical it is to your testing or calibration. Um, just bear in mind uh, if the instrument, uh, originally I would, I would, and, and this is not a requirement, uh, perhaps a year and see if it drifted any. Um, if it had, then something might want to shorten. If it hasn't, then it's something that uh, perhaps you, uh, you have to do the R word, risk, and uh, perhaps have a longer interval. Um, there's a should there, so you know that's not a shall, and that's just my take on it. Um, um, with uh, the calibration interval, you have a NIST traceable thermometer. Is it something that, uh, uh, as far as um, we were talking about, uh, when an equipment needs when the equipment needs to be calibrated or when it needs to be traceable? So it needed to be calibrated is, of course, if it needs to be uh, a traceable measurement, then it needs to be calibrated. And is it a component of your uncertainty? If so, then uh, of course it needs to be calibrated. Um, as far as the interval, um, typically I would recommend at least a year to start off with, um, depending on how much of an impact it would have on your testing or calibration, um, um, if it did happen to drift out of calibration. What is the difference between calibration and verification? Verification is, is a, a check. It's a check on the system. A calibration is, is just that. Um, it's uh, going and, and having the traceability uh, associated with the equipment in place. So uh, typically, like I said, traceability is something that uh, gets used uh, um, loosely sometimes, but it's a, a definite meaning behind traceability. So typically if the traceability is associated with the calibration, verification is associated with those intermediate checks when you see that in the standard. Uh, most AFT me methods do not state the environmental conditions in, in this regard. If a lab determine its own temperature humidity, say 18 to 24 degrees C and 70% maximum humidity, is it okay? Um, yes, you have to have them documented. And uh, if you did your due diligence and you made a determination that you can have that much, much of a fluctuation before it could possibly adversely affect the testing or calibration that's being done, then by all means, uh, an organization can document their own environmental criteria. Yeah, you're, you're using uh, an uncalibrated environmental chamber uh, by using calibrated equipment to control it. Would that be a valid method of control? Um, it most certainly would. Whenever you, with temperature, sort of look at it like an oven. 
uh, and your, your calibrated thermometer is actually your indicator. So if that's what you're actually util, utilizing um, uh, in your result is the uh, external temperature uh, devices. Um, what do we have here? Uh, you just say an uncalibrated chamber. Yeah, typically, um, yes, uh, but using a calibrated equipment to control it. Yes, if you're using that calibration, <coughs> calibrated equipment <coughs> to basically uh, compare it to the chamber, and that's your indicator that you're, you're utilizing, then by all means, uh, that's where your traceability. So even like most of the time with temperature calibration in a, like a temperature bath sort of a, a situation, the actual bath, is not where the traceability is, is coming through. It's through your traceable thermometer. You're using the uh, sort of like a thermostat, that bath either maybe jump it up a little bit, jump it down, and you're using the uh, your environmental instruments to actually uh, control uh, the uncalibrated chamber. Okay, a lot of good questions there. Uh, um, I believe that's the last one. Uh, sorry if I missed anything. Uh, so uh there um so uh before i proceed uh or let you go i just wanted to uh put up the next slide which is the uh next uh webinar um which we have already scheduled for august which is august 26th it's a wednesday and we're going to look at uh uh 2017 uh um section 8 7 um, which is a corrective action. So there are some expanded requirements in here for those of you all that are transitioning. So uh, I appreciate everybody signing in. We had had great attendance today. Um, and uh, um, look forward to uh, presenting again next month and uh, hopefully uh, have, have you with us. So uh, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for signing in with us.